Um, the title is Duty to Disclose SEC Investigations, but these principles will apply to more or less any government investigation, whether that be Department of Justice or even other investigations, related investigations, FINRA or the like. And the first question you have um, when you want to look at uh, these cases is what, if anything, do I have to disclose and when do I have to disclose it? And there are a few basic principles that have carried through since the early days. But what we'll be talking about is the fact that the balancing of factors has been changed by the financial crisis. And the reality is that courts are losing their sense of humor a bit and taking principles that were originally uh, in the analysis done by courts about what the obligation to disclose was and what you have to disclose and when, and being more aggressive about requiring disclosure. But the disclosure is less about the investigation and much more about the underlying conduct. So we start with the very basic principles, which are when you get that subpoena, be it SEC, grand jury, or the like, what do you have to look to to decide whether you have an obligation to disclose? First thing is, under Reg SK, you do not have a duty to disclose an investigation. An investigation is not a proceeding, and you only then have to disclose when you are aware and there is a certainty that government action is imminent, or if the investigation renders prior public statements misleading. And the way to look at all of this, and the best way to look at it, I think, is to look at an analysis that some of the courts have used, particularly Sixth Circuit, for example, as the question of hard and soft information. What do you know and what are you predicting? So what you see then here is the basic principle is that for the question of whether an action is imminent, that has not really changed. And the answer to that is the classic guidance is, for example, with the SEC, that you have to make a disclosure when you get a Wells notice. That has recently uh, been re-examined uh, in the Rockman case, and in that decision, the court said, no, you don't. All a Wells notice is is a notice that the enforcement uh, staff wants to bring a proceeding, but you cannot predict that a proceeding will be brought, and therefore you do not have their obligation to make a disclosure. The obligation to make a disclosure arises when the, rule, when the decision to bring a proceeding is in some sense, as hard as a fact, which is to say that a prosecutor tells you, we are going to the grand jury, we are presenting, and we are seeking an indictment. Now, I would make a distinction, and you should make a distinction in those circumstances because of the level of scrutiny that a decision is going to make. SEC commission is going to give real scrutiny to a recommendation for an enforcement proceeding. The reality in our world is the grand juries almost never supervene a decision of a prosecutor to bring a proceeding. So in terms of specifics, if your client gets a target letter, there is no obligation to disclose. If your director gets a target letter, if you are knee deep in a very complex investigation, un unless, again, you have a hard fact determination that a proceeding is imminent, you are having no duty to disclose. But what you see is that in analyzing the question, the real critical issue is the question of whether prior statements were rendered misleading, and that is all about the underlying conduct. Think of the investigation as a trigger for the analysis of whether the underlying conduct that is being investigated is going to render a duty to disclose. And the disclosure is in some sense a disclosure of the investigation becomes a proxy for the disclosure of the underlying conduct or the risk that you are going to get banged for the underlying conduct. I will say one clear thing is that is you have no obligation 
akin to an 8K. 8Ks, for example, say nothing about the four-day rule and investigations. If you are in this circumstance, you have the time to do an analysis, do an in-depth analysis, discover the facts, and then make a determination. The, the cases are relatively clear on that point. What you can't do is make an early disclosure and then not update when the facts change. So again, no statute, rule, or regulation imposes a per se duty on a registrant to disclose. That does not change. We talked a little bit about Reg SK, and this is where you, you principally look. And Rick, the Rickman decision, which is part of two Goldman Sachs decisions, Lappin v. Goldman Sachs and Rickman v. Goldman Sachs, are critical for two reasons. Both talk about the fact that the investigation per se need not be disclosed, but both talk about the fact that a relatively general prior statement can lead to a duty to disclose. And this is really the critical issue at this point. It used to be a split or a discussion point that general statements do not trigger a duty to disclose when you have an investigation and you become aware of a problematic underlying content, so long as those statements were, quote, general. However, if you make a very specific statement, then you would have a duty to update. What we are now seeing as a result of the financial crisis is, again, courts are losing their sense of humor and, quote, general statements, as, for example, Goldman Sachs was criticized for and sued for in the Lappin decision in Rockman, which is, we have high standards, we are not adverse to our clients, we do not tolerate uh, conflicts of interests and the like. Those, those general statements can now become the trigger for a duty to disclose when the underlying conduct under investigation relates to those prior statements. In, for example, the Rockman decision, the defense for Goldman Sachs says, look, our general statements about our integrity and our not having conflicts, they're puffery, they're general statements, they're statements of opinion, and so they really aren't the basis under which you can bring a securities fraud claim. Uh, in both Lappin and Rockman, the, uh, the federal judges in the Southern District of New York had no sense of humor about that and really went off on defense counsel for taking that position. And so what you are now seeing that is in flux is the generality of those statements will generate, will not protect you. And so that is where you are going to have to look. The reality is that the investigation themselves are rarely, if ever, material enough, unless you have made a prior statement about you're not under investigation that has to be updated for an investigation ever to trigger. It is really all about the underlying conduct, and that is where you have to look. The triggering event, what, when we talk about the investigation as being the triggering event, you look at the cases and you look at what the, tr what the investigation does is it gives a plaintiff or a court an anchor. It begins the timeline. And so if there is, say, misconduct five years ago, very difficult for the court or the plaintiffs to go back. You have a subpoena, grand jury, SEC, one year ago, all of a sudden they have a concrete event in which they can also look to say, well, now you had a duty to look at that underlying conduct and examine it. Once you did, what did you find? And so if you are the company making disclosure, you have the very practical analysis of saying, am I going to deal with the question of the misconduct or can I make a disclosure of the investigation, say that I cannot predict the outcome, and then take my greater time to evaluate, and then I am not giving the government a roadmap in my disclosure as to what my problems might be or predicting an outcome. Now, the general analysis, of course, is that when you look at materiality and duties to disclose, it is the probability of government action, imminent government action, modified by the consequences of that action. And so, again, you always circle back to the government action. All of this has to be in, evaluated in the complete context. And so 
the courts and plaintiffs will look to any number of things to say, was government action imminent, and how did you evaluate its consequences? The Ahmed decision is an interesting one because the Sloan supermarkets had a very aggressive uh, acquisition strategy that they touted in their annual reports and their public statements. The FTC gave them notice that it was investigating and it objected. They thought they were getting too much power and the FTC started making demands. Armed, months before a proceeding was brought, made some very significant settlement proposals, both to divest itself of certain stores and to dial back its acquisition strategy. At the same time, it con continued to talk about that acquisition strategy in its public filings. Ultimately, months later, the FTC brings a, a proceeding, Armed as an investor sues, and the district court, in analyzing what Sloan's knew and whether it had a duty to disclose, did not look on the, at the date on which the filing was made. They said, if you thought that this matter was significant enough that you had to offer to divest stores and dial back your acquisition strategy, you could not be in the market at the same time touting your acquisition strategy. You had a duty to disclose the investigation and then it might have a material impact on your strategy. It was all about what they did, what Sloan's did to try and resolve it, as opposed to when the FTC filed and, and when the FTC notified them that there was going to be a proceeding. Again, where context is important, context can help. If you look at the Imsera decision by the Second Circuit, that was a company that acquired a plant, sought FDA approval to make some uh, new products. FDA came in and reviewed plant, found 34 violations. You don't get your approval came back a second time, they found 18 violations, getting better, came back the third time, got 48 violations, stopped production at the plant. Imsera made the announcement and stock dropped significantly. Lawsuit is filed that you should have disclosed the investigations, you should have disclosed the results of the reviews, and you should have disclosed the risk that this might have a material impact on your uh, very rosy, forward-looking statements about the acquisition. Second Circuit said, had no trouble saying no. If you are in a highly regulated industry, here, medical, financial services will be the same way, you are getting inquiries all the time. You are being found in violations all of the time. You have to establish that this event is an extraordinary one, and that, again, you get this issue that can you make a determination at that point in time it is going to have an extraordinary impact? And the Second Circuit said no. You do not have the obligation in this kind of regulated environment to drop a disclosure every time you get a notice. And so when you are examining these issues, you will have to look at the entire context to make a determination. And so you can't make this analysis at one point in time. This is an analysis that has to be done weekly to see if there is a change. Now, we talked about the issue of how you think about it, and the best way to think about it is the issue, as I said, the Sixth Circuit talks about hard and soft information, where soft information is predictions and matters of opinion. So, for example, if you're under investigation, your analysis of whether they are going to pre a bring a proceeding is a function of your assessment of the body language of the government. What are they telling you? How is it going? How many people are they sending a subpoena to? What are they doing? That is all soft and you have no obligation, based on securities laws at that point, to make a determination that any prior public statement is misleading as a result. And until you have, again, information that is hard as facts, you do not have a duty to disclose. The Classic guidance, and this is changing, is that you don't have a duty to confess. Once you have an investigation and you look, you are not obligated to attack your own uh, business dealings. That, I think, is the single biggest thing that is in flux. The old learning that you shouldn't compromise your defense and you don't have an obligation to predict an outcome has really changed, and now, it, and it's an old principle, but the old principle is renewed again, which is just because a statement might, a disclosure might get somebody indicted, doesn't mean it's not material, and doesn't mean there is, an is not an obligation to disclose it. And so 
then you ask the question, okay, where do I draw the line? And where the cases are drawing the line is not with respect to individual incidents. They are really talking about pervasive misconduct, the perception of pervasive misconduct, or where there is the involvement of senior management. And what the courts are coming back to is, we're looking at this conduct, and if it becomes fundamental to an investor's evaluation of the business as a whole, then we are going to say, you are going to have to make a disclosure. Now, as I said a little earlier, the kind of general statement that used to be uh, easy to make, oh, you know, we're great people, we comply with laws, we're generally in compliance, and there were some more specific cases that say, for example, uh, we believe that we are in compliance with all Medicare regulations, or we believe we are in compliance with all applicable regulations. Those decisions were generally deemed to be too general. That has now changed. If you look, it started, I think, with Marsh and McClendon in 2006 and the Lapp and Goldman Sachs decision, where the court said, no, if you are going out as part of your story to your investors, that you are really good people, then you are going to have the obligation to disclose. Also, if you are describing the impact of your results in an MDNA discussion type way, then you are going to have a duty to update. So for example, if in one case, the result, your results uh, are the result of, and Rockman Kid Brands is a good decision, the company was touting its results as the, as the reasons for a certain mar market success. The claimed reality by the plaintiffs is the reason that Kid Brands was so successful is they were violating a variety of import-export trademark, uh, import-export regulations. The district court ruled that if Rockman had merely reported its numbers and those numbers were false, the standard guidance is, no, you know, excuse me, if Kid Brands had so reported, no duty to update. No duty to disclose that your prior numbers were wrong. You can just track out your investigation. But because Kid Brands had given its investors an explanation as to why it was successful, then that became a di directly contradicted by the knowledge of misconduct, and there there wasn't a duty to update. What was also interesting about Kid Brands is it's, it tells a little bit about the slippery slope, because if you decide to make an investigation disclosure, and the reality is that most companies nowadays are, are so risk averse that even if you are outside counsel is telling them you do not have an obligation to make a disclosure, they are choosing to make that disclosure. The key issue there is a duty to update. In Kid Brands, they made a disclosure in March that said we are under investigation by customs in this division. It was not until August that they said, oh, by the way, in addition to those divisions, we now have subsequent investigations in two other divisions. And the district court found that that was a f an actionable failure to disclose the investigation, because an investor looking at an investigation of one division would say, okay, manageable problem. Three out of their four divisions, very, very different situation. And so the court said, it, a delay in that case of five months of waiting to disclose the investigation was these latter two investigations was potentially actionable. And so we come back to this issue of if you are silent, you're in pretty good shape. But once you choose to speak, you are going to have to update and you are going to have to update with the bad news. And so if you choose to speak, there's tremendous pressure to put something optimistic. Oh, the investigation isn't so bad. The business people do not want to just put out an investigation report and have everybody imagine that everybody's going to jail. But if you are optimistic in your disclosure and say you don't believe you have a significant problem or it's not relevant or material, and it turns out that it is, you are going to have a duty to update very, very quickly. And so if you are crafting these disclosures, be very, very careful about what you say. Thank you.